how are you? How is everyone doing? I see that many of you are coming into the Zoom room. We're here for another webinar today at ICFJ's Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. In case you don't already know me, I'm Stella Roque, ICFJ's Director of Community Engagement based in Washington, D.C. I'm thrilled to welcome today Julian Scher, an award-winning investigative journalist. Julian has published six widely acclaimed books and has been an investigative reporter for Canada's two leading newspapers the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail. He was also a senior producer for TVC's The Fifth Estate, Canada's premier investigative TV program for five years. He is here today to give us a tutorial on interviewing techniques and how to ask the hard questions of your subjects while covering COVID-19. I've also had the pleasure to attend his training in person, so I'm so glad he's offering this digitally to all of us. Thank you for being here, Julian. Great to be here. Um, before we begin, I have a few quick points. If you're a journalist on Facebook but haven't joined our forum group yet, please do. Search ICFJ, Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. If you're not on Facebook, we have a mailing list that you can go sign up to receive updates on upcoming online events. Go to www.icfj.org and scroll down and click on the Covering the COVID-19 Pandemic page. Also, if you haven't taken it yet, and if you're a journalist, please take our global survey on how COVID-19 is transforming journalism, a study launched in partnership with Columbia University's Cal Center. You can also find that on www.icfj.org. Tomorrow, all the way from Hong Kong, we're bringing you Linda Liu, a reporter from the South China Morning Post, who will be with us to discuss her lessons learned reporting on a pandemic. And next week, we're bringing you Francesca Bori from Italy, a war reporter who has taken on covering COVID-19 at the front lines of Italy's hospitals. Please feel free to type your questions for Julian during this session into the Zoom chat, which you can open by clicking the chat option at the bottom of your screens. If you're watching from Facebook Live, type them in the comments below the video, and we'll make sure they get on the Zoom chat. And now for the main event, I'm turning this whole show over to you, Julian. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stella. It's an honor to, um, to be here. Uh, Stella and I uh, met at an international conference in Amman, Jordan. The slideshow you're going to see is a version of the training I've done around the world. I've trained in Bangladesh, um, through Africa and Europe. Now, it's a little hard to do it online because I really rely a lot on your questions and your feedback. Um, if you miss anything during this, this, the next hour, you could email me with questions. You'll get my contact information. And the entire slideshow is available on my website. Um, and you could look at any of the videos. Um, I realize for a lot of you, English is not your, your first language. I'll try to speak slowly. But of course, all, all the examples I'm showing you are in English. They're videos of some famous um, interviews with people like President Trump, or former President Obama, and others. Um, so if you miss any of the videos, you could watch them again. Um, let's start right away. Let me launch um, the slideshow. Hold on. Whoa. I'm going to share. Let's hope, make sure everything works. Here we go. Uh, give me a moment. And we're going to open up the slideshow. And here we go. Okay, I hope everybody could see the slideshow. You can't connect to the Wi-Fi network. You might want to check the connection settings in the Google Home app. Sorry about that. All right, so what we're going to look at is examples of investigative interviews. Um, some, uh, these are going to be general interviews, not just around COVID, and then we'll take some COVID examples. Um, what I, I want you to be able to understand is that every interview, Every interview you do, whether it's with a victim of COVID or the president of your country, is a constant fight for control. And if you think about it, um, those of you who follow sports or not, whether you're playing um, uh, football uh, or basketball, any sport, every sport is about who controls the ball and how do you score in sports? Well, the only way you score in sports is by controlling the ball. Now in sports, you'd be lucky in any uh, football game you were watching in your home country if the home team controls 50% of the game. The problem, the challenge we face as journalists is that you have to be in control 100% of the time. 
And that's the real challenge because the person you're interviewing is going to want to seize back control. And what we're going to look at in the next hour is how can you make sure you don't lose control of the interview? You will. Don't worry. <laughs> you will lose control. That's by nature of it. But how do you try to keep as much control as possible? All right, we're gonna look at three things today, the ABCs of good interviews. We're gonna look at three different types of interviews. Then we're gonna look at five rules for good interviews. And finally, we'll look at what to do when you get into trouble, because you will get into trouble. Not because you're not a good journalist, it's just inevitable. We always get into trouble because we're dealing with smart opponents. Okay. Now, think about it. How do you prepare for a tough interview? Um, I bet if, if you were assigned today, your editor came to you and said, quick, uh, the health minister has agreed to sit down. Um, will you go interview him? How do you prepare? You do what we all do as journalists. You start scrambling and you start researching, trying to dig up facts. And that's good. That's fine. That's what we do. And I'm not here to teach you how to research and how to do facts. Um, there are plenty other courses about that. I'm assuming you're all great at digging up research and facts. The problem is you're spending so much time dealing with research and facts, you're not dealing with the strategy of the interview. So that's what we're going to focus on this hour, not the research. I'm assuming you've done amazing research. You're ready for that interview with the health minister or the head of the hospital where they're dealing with COVID. But you have to think about the strategy. So before you rush out to do an interview, the first thing, and this is the first most important lesson I want you to take away from uh, today, is you have to figure out what kind of interview you are doing. Now let's imagine you're assigned to this story. Uh, nurses are dying at your local hospital um, and they're complaining that they were unprotected. Um, they didn't get masks um, from the hospital director or the health minister. And you've got an interview with the head of the hospital or with the head of the health minister. So you've done all your research, you've talked to the nurses, you're ready to go in. But what I want you to think about first is what kind of interview are you doing? Because in the history of time, since the very first cavemen and cave women were debating what's for supper and did they kill the, uh, the, the animals to eat, um, to what you're asking your child tonight about what she did in the playground, there are three types of interviews. There's the information interview, the emotion interview, and the accountability interview. And the best interviews have all three. So if you were sitting down with the hospital, well, let me go back a bit here. So for example, you're interviewing an expert on COVID, it's mainly gonna be information. You might want a bit of emotion about the person. Um, you're not gonna do much accountability unless this expert is a fraudster and you want to expose them. So that's gonna be an information interview. You're doing a victim, the person is not an expert, you can't get much information from them, but you're gonna go mainly for emotion and their human story. But obviously, if you were interviewing the leader of your country, if you wanted to ask Putin about why Russian doctors are dying or President Xi of China about the secrecy, when we're interviewing the powerful, and that's what investigative interviews are about, it's all about accountability. So what I want you to do the next time you set out to do an interview is figure out the percentage. Am I mainly gonna do emotion? Am I mainly gonna do information? Or am I mainly gonna do accountability? Now the best interviews, as I said, have all three, and usually in this order. So for example, if you were doing a story on these nurses who were dying in the hospital, um, you would start with questions like, when did you first learn about the COVID outbreak? That's information. You wanna find out when did they find out the nurses were dying? You might go for an emotional question. Um, you know, how, how much did you care about the nurses? What did you know about the nurses who died? And then you'd move in to the kill. You'd push the director or the health minister about how guilty they feel because they're responsible for the deaths. Now, you can't start there because you want to warm up. You need to get the information and emotion and then build to people, um, feel to the accountability. If you only have one minute and your health minister is running out of the car um, into a meeting, you could then ask that 
uh, uh, that first question. But otherwise, you have to follow that order, start with information, some emotion, and then go to accountability. Let me give you a brief example. This is a famous American example of a basketball star who was um, uh, caught with uh, uh, allegations of sexual uh, molestation. Um, I'm just looking at the chat here for a minute. Stella, you might want to feed me some of the questions because it's hard for me to do the slideshow and look at the questions. Um, now take a look at how she will go from information about why are you with us to a question about emotion and then right away move into accountability. The singer, as you know, has faced intense scrutiny for more than a decade now. It was reignited in January after the Lifetime docuseries Surviving R. Kelly featured interviews with seven accusers and former members of his inner circle. They all say that Kelly preys on vulnerable women and young girls. I am surprised that you agreed to do it. Why are you sitting down with us today? I'm very tired of all of the... Uh last i've been hearing things and you know and seeing things on the blocks and you know i'm just i'm just tired what are the lies that you're hearing that disturb you most oh my god um all of them um got little girls trapped in the basement helicopters over my house mm -hmm. um trying to um rescue someone that doesn't need rescuing because they're not in my house, handcuffing people, starving people. I have a harem, uh, what you call it, a, um, a coat. Mm -hmm. I don't even really know what a coat is, but I, I know I don't have one, you know. Have you done anything that you regret? Have you done anything wrong? Now Lots she of starts things the wrong accountability. When it comes to women, that I apologize, but I apologize in those relationships at the time I was in the relationships. Have okay. you broken any laws when it comes to women? Absolutely not. The six-part series interviewed 50 people, mm -hmm. family members, your former tour manager, numerous women who all claim that you abused them. Are you saying everybody in that documentary was not telling the truth about you? Everybody? They are lying on me. Why would these women say the same thing about you, that you are controlling, that you are abusive, that you tell women when to eat, when to go to the bathroom, when they can sleep, where they can dress? Why would all these women tell these different stories about you? if they were not true, and they don't know each other. That defies logic to me. Stop it, y'all quit playing. Quit playing. Robert. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me, y'all. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this I got to have 30 years of my career. Robert. 30 years of my career. Y'all trying to kill me. You killing me, man. The singer, as you know, is faced. Now, that's a classic example. And she followed, She could have started right in with the interrogation, but it wouldn't have worked. She starts with information, then goes to emotion, and then concentrates. 90% of her interview is accountability. And what I want you to do um, in, the, in the future is do the same thing. Before you set out for your interview, map out what percentage of your questions are going to be information, emotion, and accountability. All right, once you've done that, the interview starts, you have to follow some basic rules to make sure that um, you're asking the right questions and you stay in control. And I want to go through just a handful of some of the most important rules. Um, now, um, uh, I really get tired when uh, journalists who, who I'm working with and people on my staff complain that, oh, how'd the interview go? And they say, well, it didn't go well. Uh, the person didn't give good answers. For me, that's like a doctor asking a doctor, how'd the patient do? And you say, oh, it didn't go well. Um, he died, as if it's the patient's fault. You're responsible for the interview. You can't blame the failure of the interview on the fact that the person gave bad answers. If you ask a stupid question, you'll get a stupid answer. The first rule is kind of obvious. Most of you do it very well. It's you ask the five W's. You have to ask open-ended questions. Who, what, where, why, when? Because if you ask a yes, no question, you will often just get a yes, no answer. And that's not gonna give you much of a, of a quote. Um, uh, here's a funny example. Um, 
what happens when uh, this is a little boy who nearly died um, from E. coli. Um, and you'll see uh, the, the problems when you just ask a yes, no question. It was full of blood and obviously uh, they raised a lot of concern. We took him to the hospital immediately. Elijah, do you remember those days? Yes. I think that I would like to see uh, federal, yeah, something done at the federal level whereby ranchers or whoever's responsible for the feeding of the cattle, that there's a system in place whereby, you know, we can guarantee that there's no E. coli in the system. All right, Elijah, do you want to eat steak again? No. No. Obviously, that's not what the journalist wanted. She didn't want to know who was going to eat steak. She wanted to get, she didn't want a yes, no answer, but she asked a yes, no question, and that's the answer she got. So don't ask yes, no. This is a, another really common mistake people make. Don't give people an escape route. And this happens when you, you're so nervous, you keep rattling on um, and you forget to ask only one question at a time because if you give people easy choices they will take the easy exit so um, watch what happens um, in 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 this interview you're down 11 heading into the fourth tonight in this game is there ever a point at which you don't think you can come back and what's your mindset Okay, so this is a basketball game, and this is the question she asked. The, the team was losing, and she says, is there ever a point at which you don't think you can come back, and what's your mindset? Now, I want you to think for a moment. Look at the screen. What's wrong with that question? Think. Here's what's wrong with that question. It's not a question. It's two questions. Which one do you think he's going to answer? Watch. You go, you know, you're down 19 to the Pacers. You're down 11 heading into the fourth tonight in this game. Is there ever a point at which you don't think you can come back? And what's your mindset? No. Yeah, so tell me about that. Thank you. So this is what happened. We wanted, the question we wanted was, what were you thinking when you were losing, um, when the game looked hopeless? But because she kept on talking, he answered, the second question, the easier one. So that's what somebody will always do. This is the next most important point that I want you to remember and burn into your brain. What is a question mark? A question mark is the end of a sentence. When a question comes out of your mouth and you are still talking, you have to figure out why am I still talking? The sentence ended. That was a question mark. Stop talking. Usually you keep asking questions because you're nervous. You're not sure if you asked the right question. Ask one question only and stop. It's really important. All right, next example is because we think we're so smart, we like to ask complicated questions and we add all kinds of fancy words. But experienced politicians will jump on the simplest word. Watch what happens here. President Obama, uh, um, uh, when uh, Barack Obama was president, was asked about hostages in Iran. I want you to read this question very quickly. He's asked, as you know, there are four American hostages in Iran. Can you tell the country, sir, why you are content with all the fanfare to leave these hostages unaccounted for? Take a quick look. What is the one word? This is a good, tough question, except for one mistake, because they're asking Obama, what are you going to do about the hostages? But Obama will jump on one word. Watch the word that he will jump on. held on trumped up charges according to your administration one whereabouts unknown can you tell the country sir why you are content with all the fanfare around this deal to leave the conscience of this nation and the strength of this nation unaccounted for watch obama's face he Americans. knows he's gone and out i gotta give you credit major for how you craft those uh, those questions for the, the notion that i'm content as i celebrate with american citizens languishing and Iranian jails? Major, that, that's nonsense. And you should know better. I've met with the families of some of those folks. Nobody's content. 
So Obama gets away from answering a tough question. Why? Because he sees one word, there it is, content, in a huge question. And that's what the leaders of your country, that's what the top health officials will do. If you ask a complicated question that has one inflammatory word, these people are smart enough to seize on it. So don't do it. Okay. Um, the worst question is not asking one. Journalists, if you get into a debate, you will always lose. Why do you think you'll always lose? Think about this for a minute. Just think to yourself, why if you get into a debate with your health minister or your president or the head of a hospital, why will you lose? Even if you're smarter. Here's why. You will lose because it's an unfair fight. The person you're interviewing is allowed to lie, deflect, make things up. You can't. You're a journalist. You have to stick with the facts. You have no choice. They can do everything to deflect from telling the truth. You can't. You will always lose a debate. Always. Now, debates can be fun, as you'll see here in a minute. That could be fun to watch, but it's not journalism, right? You're not getting information. Now, the problem with debates, getting into a debate, is that smart interview guests will turn the tables and they will start asking you questions. Now, watch what happens here. Morgan Freeman, famous American actor, is being interviewed by one of the most famous journalists in American television about the fact that he doesn't agree with something they have in America called Black History Month. I'll show you the questions after. But take a look at this video. Ridiculous. Why? You're going to relegate my history to a month? Oh, come on. What do you do with yours? What, which month is white history month? <laughs> no, well, no, no, come on. Tell me. Well, the, I'm Jewish. Okay. Which I'm month Jewish. is Jewish history month? Uh, there isn't one. Oh. Oh. Why not? Yeah. Do you want one? No, no, no. I, 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 so what happened there? What happened there is that Morgan Freeman starts interviewing the journalist, right? These are his answers. You're going to regulate my history to a month. Which one is yours? Which month is White History Month? Which month is Jewish History Month? Do you want one? That's why you don't want to get into a debate because a smart interview guest will turn the tables on you. All right, the final rule to look at is the importance of listening. I'm amazed when I watch interviews how we don't listen enough. And by that, I mean you're so busy thinking about your next question or thinking whether you've got a good answer that you're not listening, not just to the words, but to what they're really saying. And those are the two things I want you to consider next, is that you need to use the, those words because once they've said something, you could now own it and turn it. But you also have to look at the meaning of what they say. Let's look at this COVID example. Now, recently, the mayor of Las Vegas, in America, some of you know, Las Vegas is the gambling capital of, of the world. It's where all the casinos were. And the mayor of Las Vegas um, is being interviewed by Anderson Cooper of CNN, and she's ready to open up the casinos. Now, I'm going to show you three excerpts, and I want you to look at the three. The first one, she basically says without ever saying that she does not have a plan. Um, but Cooper will expose that that's the meaning of her word. He's listening to the meaning of what she's saying. Then she will actually use the word control group and Cooper will jump on that because she's now said it. And finally, she herself will never say explicitly she won't go to the casinos, but Cooper will make it clear that's the result of her words. So I want you to listen to these three sections. 
The first is where she doesn't say something, but it's the meaning. Then she uses the words and he jumps on that. And finally, she, the import of her not will, being willing to go to the casinos. Watch carefully. The, you're, you're, I mean, you're talking about encouraging hundreds of thousands of people to come to Las Vegas. Yeah. I get the, the financial yeah. losses people are suffering, which is awful. But you're encouraging, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people coming there in casinos, smoking, drinking, touching slot machines, breathing circulated air, and then returning home to states around America and countries around the world. Doesn't that sound like a virus Petri dish? I mean, how is that No, what it sounds like, you're being an alarmist. I'm not. I've lived a long life. I grew up in the heart of Manhattan. I know what it's like to be with subways and on buses and I'm crammed an into elevators. I think you are by saying what you have just said. So you don't I'm believe the there should be any social distancing? You don't believe of that this is I a... Of course I believe there should be. Of course. I'm okay, a How do you do that in a casino? That's up to them to figure out. I'm, I don't own a casino. I don't know anything wait about minute, wait, wait a minute, a wait a minute. I'm sorry. You're the mayor of Las Vegas. And yes. you're calling, you want casinos to be open, even though you have no authority, thank yes. you, over casinos. But yes. you, you say open them up, but you have no responsibility about how that would be done no, safely. No, see how he interrupted her? You could see his eyes thinking, because he realizes that she has, is announcing uh, her desire to open the casinos, but she doesn't have a plan. She never said that explicitly, but that's the meaning, and he jumps on blurring. it. No, 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 you're blurring. You said it's I'm not your job. There. It, I am not a private owner of a hotel. I wish I were, and I would have the cleanest hotel with six feet figured out for every human being comes so in there. If you can't figure out how to do this safely, why, as mayor of a city that you were responsible for the people's safety, are you calling for something that you have no plan for how it would be done safely? We offer to be a control group. Anybody who knows anything about statistics knows that for instance, you have a vaccine. Now, she just used the word control group, right? Which is a test group. Anderson realizes he could jump on this now. Offering the, the citizens of Las Vegas to be a control group to see if your theory on social distancing no, 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 work. wrong. Absolutely wrong. Don't put words in my mouth. You just what said I we'll said be a control offered, group. Excuse me. What I said was I offered to be a control group, and I was told by our statistician you can't do that. So, if casinos reopen, are you going to be inside those casinos every single night putting your own life on the line? Okay, that's an important question, right? He's coming to the end, and he's basically, in this case, asking a yes-no question. Are you willing to put your to risk your life and go to the casinos? But she won't answer, so watch what he does. I have lived in this town for 56 not, years. Are you going to go and to the casinos no, no, no. every night and put your life on the line no, like I, all the workers? I, you say I've you were there holding town, your hands. So I... Uh, they don't need it. We weren't broken. We as tragically have 150 people we lost. Tragic. We have 2.3 million people here. I haven't heard and you we say yes, that you would be sitting on those casino floors every night along with the people that you say you are holding their hands with. What, what is the purpose of that? First of all, I have the family. Because and it, would I cook be putting your money, it would be night. putting what money where doing? your mouth is, to use, a, I guess, a Las Vegas wait, wait, term. Anderson, if you, you say it's this. safe. Anderson. Okay, so you're not Anderson willing to sit on the casino is, floors with them when they're reopened <laughs> and breathe the refiltered all, air. So, uh, the, you're, again, to recap, what I like about this interview is he attacks her on three different points. The first one and the third one, she never uses those words, but he understands the meaning of her words and he pushes. And in the middle example, she does use the word control group and he jumps on that. That's why I listen. Okay, to recap, and don't worry if you've missed these slides, they're all going to be available on my slideshow. These are some of the five basic rules of interviewing. And we had examples of what happens when you don't obey those rules. What happens when you don't obey those rules is that you lose control of the, um, the interview. 
going to just come back on screen for a moment. So that's what's important about these rules. Now, in a longer version of the slideshow, I explain how often, of course, you have to break these rules sometimes. Um, but you have to be experienced so you know how to break the rules. Sometimes, for example, you actually do want a yes, no answer. For example, Anderson Cooper there asked the mayor, will you go into the casinos? You actually want a yes, no answer. And of course, she was too frightened to give an answer. So it's okay to break the rules if you understand that you're breaking the rules. But these rules are designed so that you can be sure, um, you can know that you are absolutely trying to keep control. Because when you break the rules, what happens? The Obamas, the Trumps, your president, my prime minister will jump on your mistakes to seize back control. That's why you need to stick to these five basic rules. That's also why you have to figure out in your own mind what is information, what is emotion, what is accountability. And if you're going into an accountability interview with the head of your country or a, an important official, you've got to figure out the order. Maybe I'll ask a couple of information questions, then some emotion, but then you have to plan your, um, your hard questions. All right, let's go back to the slideshow. Um, and we're going to look at briefly now what to do when you get into trouble. Because you are going to get into trouble. You are definitely going to lose more often than you will win. It's not, again, because you're not good journalists. I have never done an interview um, where there wasn't a moment where I lost control and I had to fight to get it back. Um, usually because the people you're interviewing are experts at lying or at least trying to hide the truth. So let's look at, a, at three things you could do when you lose control. Now, often an interview will turn into an argument, um, you're, especially if it's a powerful person and especially if it's a powerful man. And they will try to seize control and often attack you, often, especially if you're a woman. So you have to be firm. Um, you have to um, uh, stand up and, 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 and not be bullied. Um, don't be afraid to stand up for yourself. Here's one example. Um, uh, it's an example from Lebanon. Uh, it's in Arabic, but the, there are subtitles in English, where a famous female host um, is interviewing a, a, a sheikh, and he will start attacking her. And watch what she does. بهذا الوقت كيف عم بتكون آلية استقطابهم؟ شو الشعارات اللي عم تنقلهم لينضموا؟ أنا لا اسمعي اسمعي أنت ستقاطعين وأنا أجيب كما أريد أنا لا تجيبي كما أنت شاهد شاهد أنا شاهد زور أنا بأخدم الفكرة لحظة. التي أريد خلاص طب اسكتي حتى أستطيع أن أتكلم أولا هذه أنا بأتكلم لكي يفهم أول شيء كيف شيخ محترم مثلك بقول اسكتي لمذيعة معلش كيف بتقول اسكتي يعني؟ أنا محترم خلاص ما عاد بدي كفي هذا الموضوع فينا نوقف الموضوع أنا لا أنا لا يشرفني إن أحضر فينا نوقف الموضوع لو سمحتوا شباب لا أنت لحظة 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 يعني أو بده يكون في احترام متبادل أو بلي الموضوع كله و That's a pretty good example of somebody standing up Now here's a famous recent example seen this Now um, this reporter um, uh, Wen Jie Jiang of CBS News asks Trump a question and Trump will hurl back uh, uh, a question that has a racist in insinuation and watch what she does. Keep in mind, she's talking to the president of, of the United States. Okay, watch what happens. Uh, yeah, go ahead, please many times that the U.S. is doing far better than any other country when it comes to testing. Yes. Why does that matter? Why is this a global competition to you if every day Americans are still losing their lives and we're still seeing more cases every day? 
Well, okay, that's a good, reasonable question. It's open-ended. He's at, she's asking the president, why does it matter? Why are you making this a competition? Good, open-ended question. Watch how he responds. Losing their lives everywhere in the world. And maybe that's a question you should ask China. Don't ask me, ask China that question, okay? When you ask them that question, you may get a very unusual answer, yes. Now watch what she does. He just, you know, be, uh, used the word China, and uh, I think in, in, a, in, a, in a racist way directed towards her. Watch what she does. Behind you, please. What, sir, why are you saying that to me specifically? I'm telling you, I'm not saying it specifically to anybody. I'm saying it to anybody that would ask a nasty question That's like that. That's not a nasty question. Please message. go ahead. Why does it matter? Okay, uh, anybody else? Please go ahead. The back, Trump please. is now getting rattled. No, it's okay. But we'll you pointed to me. I have two questions, Mr. Next, President. next, please. But you did. You called on me. I did, and you didn't respond, and now I'm calling on Sorry, I just the young lady in the back, please. I just wanted to let my colleague okay. finish, but can I ask you Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Appreciate but it. You thank you very much. And he leaves. So I think that's a great example um, of a reporter standing up to the most powerful man in the world um, and not giving an inch. Second exa example, now you have to fight back, but you have to fight back smart and you have to not lose focus. Um, you, whatever your question is about, you have to keep the focus of the question because your opponent will try to distract you and the audience by talking about other things. Now, watch what happens here. Paula Reed of CBS is going to ask Trump about why he did nothing in the month of February. Um, you'll see a lot of yelling and crosstalk. So I've written up the questions here. Now, what happened is Trump held a press conference where he showed a video of all the great things his, he, he says his administration did, starting with the travel ban from China in January. But Paula says, okay, but what did you do about the time that you had bought with that travel ban, the month of February? And he keeps coming back and saying, no, 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 there were no cases. And she says, but for the entire month of February, what did you do? What did you do? You'll see there are seven questions she will ask. Hard to hear in the, in the yelling match, but she never loses focus. Take a listen. I saved tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of lives by the time that you bought. The argument is that you bought yourself some time. You didn't use it to prepare hospitals. You didn't use it to ramp up testing. Right you're so, now, you're so, you're so disgraceful. It's so disgraceful the way you say that. Let, let me just listen. I just went over it. I just went over it. Nobody thought we should do it. And when I did it. But what did you do with the time that you bought? You know, we. See, he keeps talking about what he did in January. Paula keeps pushing him about February. In February. That, you know what we did? Yeah. What do you do? February. What do you do when you have no case in the whole United States? You had cases when in you, February. you excuse me. You reported it. Zero cases, zero deaths on January 17th. Again, he's talking about January. What does Paula do? He she keeps pushing him about February. February, the entire January, month of February, I said in January. The video has a complete gap. On, on January 30th. What did your administration do in February for the time that your travel ban bought A lot. You? A lot. And in fact, we'll give you a list. What we did, in fact, part of it was up there. It we did a lot. Look, look. Now he realizes he doesn't have an answer for what he did in February because they did nothing. So watch what he does. He turns and he attacks the journalist. You're a fake. You know that. Your whole network, the way you cover it, is fake. And most of you, and not all of you, but the people are wise to you. That's why you have a lower, a lower approval rating than you've ever had before, times probably three. I so, saved tens. So what she was able to show is, in fact, he had nothing. He could have answered with any kind of example of what he did in February, but he did nothing in February. She never lost focus, and she was able to take on... Um, uh, the president. Now, final tip about fighting smart is 
it's similar to keeping your focus is that sometimes you pretty much have to ask the same question. It sounds a little ridiculous, but if somebody is not answering the question, you keep asking it um, uh, until they answer, or at least you'll prove to your audience that they're afraid to answer the question. But watch what happens here when Caitlin Collins of CNN pushes Trump about total authority and she will keep asking the same question in a different form. You said when someone is president of the United States, their authority is total. That is not true. Okay, you know what we're gonna do? We're going to write up papers on this. It's not gonna be necessary because the governors need us. So he hasn't answered the question, right? She asked, who told you that you had total authority over um, uh, rules about COVID? And he doesn't answer. Way or the other, because ultimately it comes with the federal government. That being said, we're getting along very well with the governors, and I feel very certain that uh, there won't be a problem. Has yeah, please governor, go ahead. Has any governor agreed that you have the authority to decide when their state? I haven't asked anybody because I don't, you know why? Because I don't have to. Go ahead, please. Now he wants to move on to um, another questioner because he doesn't like Caitlin's pushing, and she's going to ask him the same question a third time and then watch how he cuts her off. The president has the total authority. Enough. See, he says enough because he has had enough. Um, and he is frustrated by being asked the same question because he can't answer the question. That's why she does a good job. So these were her questions. Who, who told you um, that their authority is, to, is, um, is total? going to skip this example so we can get to the questions. Now, just to recap, the ABCs of what we tried to cover today. Um, remember, there are three different types of interviews. And remember, what kind of interview are you doing? Are you doing an information interview? Are you doing an emotion interview? Are you doing accountability? Or are you doing all three? The five rules of good interviews and what to do when you get into trouble. So. Keep in mind these three and figure out the percentage. These are the five rules uh, to try to follow. Otherwise, you're going to lose control. And these are the three ways um, you could uh, try to save yourself when you get into trouble. Fight back, don't lose focus, and keep asking the same question. Now, you could find this entire slideshow on my website, julianshare.com slash training. Um, plus, you could see the complete investigative interview class, which is about two hours long and has a lot more video examples. Um, also, I have a COVID uh, resource page uh, on my website, which has lots of links, including, of course, to this forum um, that you could use in your, in your, in your work. And of course, keep in touch. Um, I'll answer all your emails and your questions. Uh, you could follow me on Twitter and you could email me at the address here, julian at share.com. So um, I tried to um, get through this um, uh, as quickly as we could to answer your questions. So let's look at um, some of the questions that have been um, asked. So I'm going to try to do most of them in order. Thank you for your questions. And if we run out of time, we have about a good 15, 20 minutes. So keep uh, forwarding more questions, but you could follow up with me um, after it as well. Okay, so uh, let's see. Claudio Lopez Loreda, excuse me if I'm not always pronouncing your names right, asks, what are your views on interrupting and risk missing as an important part of what the person is going to say versus letting the person finish and risk losing the train of thought or momentum? Excellent, excellent ex question. And it goes back to what we said at the beginning, right? That fight. An interview is all about control. So one way um, uh, your guest is going to try to get control is by occupying time. Right? They're going to want to talk, 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 talk. So you run out the clock and you don't have time to get to your questions. So it's a bit of a dilemma, as Claudia points out, because on the one hand, what they're saying is more important than you. You don't want to do most of the talking. You want to ask very short, pointed questions. But if your guest is talking 
and talking uselessly, is using the time to try to just babble on and eat up the time. Or if your guest goes off topic, I think you should interrupt. And you could do it in a very polite way. Um, some of the BBC journalists, if you listen to their daily podcasts, are excellent. Um, and you could be very polite. So, you know, you could sort of say, excuse me for interrupting, but I don't think you're answering my question. Or you could say, excuse me for, 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 for interrupting, but you're, you're, what you're saying doesn't pertain to the question I asked. And then you ask the question again. So you can be polite, but you're in control. You have to fight for control. So I'm all in favor of interrupting. Let them go on for a bit, especially if you have the time. Um, but like that woman we saw from Lebanon, when her shake was going on and on and was ignoring her questions, she interrupted and eventually cut it off. So I'm in favor of interrupting politely, but firmly. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, Another uh, person asked when I showed the example of the Lebanese woman, she said, is there a limit to how you fight back? Um, the type of word to be used so that you won't be seen as an opposition spokesman, especially in a country like mine in Nigeria, where journalists are seen as either opposition apologists or government sympathizers. Another excellent um, question. Um, in a longer version of uh, my, my course, we talk about the style you should use. Um, and obviously things are different um, if you're, you're working in a country in North America or Europe where you have a lot of legal protections. I've, I've trained and worked all through Africa. I just came back uh, from filming in Afghanistan. Um, we interviewed uh, military people, we interviewed the Taliban. So obviously, depending where you are and what the rules of your country are and how much protection your boss is willing to give you, you have to be measured and careful in what words and, and what you say. So never break the law, never put yourself at risk of, of going to jail uh, or being harassed, but you do have to be courageous. I think generally the rule of thumb is to be understated, to be calm, no matter how angry you may personally be feeling, um, either because you know people who are dying of COVID, you know the politician, say in Nigeria or anywhere else, you know the people sitting in front of you are lying and people are dying. But look at how um, the journalist from CBS responded to Trump, right? When Trump basically told her, because she's Asian, go ask China. That's a very personal insult. And it's an insult, I think, to all Asian Americans. Um, it was pointed out, by the way, that her parents came, I believe, to America uh, before uh, and had been there longer than Trump's parents had come because they were immigrants. But she doesn't take it, she takes it personally. She stands up, but she asks a journalistic question. Right? She says, why are you asking me that question? So she throws it back to him again. She doesn't make it personal. So I think that's the answer. Don't use inflammatory language. Don't make it personal. Um, and let the minister or let the person at your news conference make it personal by attacking you. So protect yourself, but be reasonable, be understated. Okay, another question. Um, okay, uh, okay, here's a question from Sonia Basca. Um, would love to hear more about how to break some of the rules. Um, uh, because I was worried about time, I took out all the slides of examples of, of breaking the rules. But you can break all of the rules, and in fact, you have to break the rules. You just have to know you're breaking them. That's the difference. An inexperienced football player will break the rules and get penalized and get a yellow card or a red card because they don't know what the rules are. A good football player knows how to break the rules and score a point. So let's run through some of the rules. Remember we said don't ask a yes, no question, but sometimes you absolutely want a yes, no question. Remember Anderson Cooper said, would you personally, Mr. Mayor, go to a casino? One trick when you break the yes, no rule, is usually you don't wanna ask a yes, no question because you don't want the person to just say yes, you want a full answer. 
That's why you want to know, you want the why question. Uh, remember the CNN journalist who, who didn't say, Mr. Trump, do you have total authority? She said, who told you you had total authority? But when you do ask a yes, no question, force them to only answer yes, no. So what you can do is you could say, I know you have complicated answers, but right now the people of our country want a simple yes, no answer. Mr. Minister, do you, um, uh, sorry, just lost the light here. Here we go. Mr. Minister, um, uh, did you order the masks not to be delivered to the hospital? Yes or no? In other words, ask your question and explicitly tell them you only want a yes, no answer. That's an example of that. Second, remember we used the example of an inflammatory word. So we said, don't use, the, don't use remember when the journalist asked uh, Obama whether he was content to um, let the hostages wither away in Iran and Obama seized on the word. So you don't wanna use inflammatory words, but sometimes you do wanna use an inflammatory word because you want the person you're interviewing to use that word and be forced to respond. Um, it's hard to do, but if you plant some important words, it could be really, really helpful. So for example, um, uh, you know, if one trick is to ask an either or question where the person is forced to choose and use one of the words. So you could say, if you were interviewing somebody accused of corruption, say with COVID supplies um, and the supplies weren't coming in, uh, you could say, Mr. Minister, your critics say you were either corrupt or incompetent, right? You know, which one were you? Now, <laughs> you're forcing the person to choose between corrupt or incompetent. And those are inflammatory words, but inevitably it's possible the minister will say, I'm neither corrupt or incompetent. And then he's gonna go on. Now you have a clip. He, he has said, I am not corrupt. He's used the word corrupt. Once he's used the word corrupt, you can now say, ah, but sir, there have been allegations of corruption in the health department because he used the word corrupt. So that's a good trick. Plant an inflammatory word only if you know for sure you're gonna be able to, uh, to jump on it. Uh, a few other examples of, uh, uh, of breaking the rules on my website. A question from Susan uh, Newhook. How do you differentiate between strategies for pros, often accountability and regular people, often emotion and information? Excellent question. I love these questions, They're very good. Um, uh, well, we've got about eight minutes or so, but we, I'm told we can maybe run a few minutes longer to get through all your questions. Okay, so clearly you have to make a distinction between people who have power um, your, your ministers in Nigeria or Italy or in Latin America, Trump, Obama, um, and ordinary people. Although sometimes ordinary people have power. You're interviewing a husband who's uh, accused of beating his wife uh, under uh, lockdown in COVID. He has power. He has power over his wife. So ordinary people can also be subject to accountability. Um, so generally, of course, you're not going to have too much accountability with ordinary people where you basically want information. When you just want information, how many people died, when did they die, it can be very smooth, very professional. Emotion is a little harder. I think you have to be respectful. I think you often have to tell people, this is a hard question for me to ask, and I know it's hard for you to answer, um, but it's my job. People want to know how your daughter died, and, and you could push the emotion. Don't be afraid, though, sometimes to ask some accountability questions, even with victims. Sometimes victims, um, there's some accountability, either mistakes they made or their family made. And you could be apologetic and explain that um, this is a hard question to ask, but you have to ask the tough question. That's the difference. You're polite and you're kind. With people in power, you have a right to push and they have a right to be held accountable. Um, uh, Caitlin Andrews asks, what do you see as the pressure points of the COVID-19 response that are worth exploring in order to get a better sense of a state's response? Um, okay, that's a broad question that has to do with, um, with COVID, obviously, and, and epidemics. I think um, one, of the, 
one of the real important pressure points that's coming to play um, in North America, all through Latin America. We're seeing it in Brazil. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing it um, uh, in, in the Asian countries and all through Africa, is the question of politics versus science. Politics and economics versus science. And part of our role, most of us are not scientific journalists. We leave that to the science journalists. But it's becoming increasingly clear that countries that have put science first and have put the scientists in front of the national news conferences versus governments um, uh, like in Brazil or in America that have pushed politics over science, that's having deadly consequences. And I think that's something you could push because it's not you as a journalist, you can promote the scientists and the scientists who are who are pushing. Look in Africa, the popularity of, of, these, um, of these fake miracle cures. The second pressure point I think that's worth really pushing is politicians of all stripes who are using COVID as a way for their own political agenda, which often has to do with repression. So if you look at the attacks on the media in Hungary, um, through Latin America, obviously in China, even in America, I think that's important. Because in a time of crisis, what do leaders do? They want to clamp down on the critics, and that's us. So I think that's an important um, question point. OK, um, a long question here. Can't see who it's from. Um, says, is it good journalist to always go into an interview with your own presupposed agenda, get him to confess to something? Or is it better to keep an open mind and report on what it is said? I never like it when editors tell me what the story is going to look like when we don't even know what the story is yet. I agree. I think there's a difference between, I don't think you should have an agenda. I don't think you should have um, your political bias. Um, uh, I don't think you should be, okay, we're going to get the goods and we're going to nail that person. I think as journalists, um, you should um, have uh, an open mind. Oh, I see now the question is from Deanna Weniger. Hope I pronounced your name right, uh, Deanna. It's a good question. So I don't think you should have a bias. Um, and you're right. I don't think you should say this is what the story is going to look like. However, I do think after you've done a lot of research, you should have a pretty good idea of where you think some of the storylines are going to go. It's like a police investigation. You know, you're investigating a murder and initially you don't have much idea, but as things go along, you begin to have a few suspects. It's good to have suspects. So I think you should have an open mind. It's very important not to have tunnel vision. I think it's really important to let yourself open to be surprised. That's why you ask open-ended questions. So you shouldn't come in with a whole list of, of what you're convinced this person is going to say. But I think it is good to have a strategy. It is good to have the evidence and say, as far as I know right now, this person has been lying about this, this, or this, or this person must answer these questions because these are serious problems. And this is what our investigation has shown. There's a difference between being biased and a difference and, and coming to a journalistic conclusion based on your investigation. And in that sense, you can have an agenda not a political agenda, but your agenda is based on facts because you know that you are going to be able to prove things and you want to hold somebody to account. That's not having agenda. That's being a good journalist. All right. Um, okay. A question from Vinod Kumar Menon. Uh, my question is, how do you raise questions with the government when you know the government data on COVID-19 is not accurate or they are hiding the numbers? Um, all right, tough question, um, especially if you're dealing in a, in a country where there's not a lot of information. Um, the one advantage because of the international center and international sites is even if your government is lying, there are international sources um, that you can rely on and you should be able to cite those numbers. And if the, uh, the government is not giving you the answers, you, that's what you have to ask. You say, why are you hiding the numbers? You could say, how is it possible every country in the world has hundreds or thousands of deaths and we have zero, we have none. Why are you afraid uh, to release the numbers 
uh, in, a, uh, in a regular way. Push, talk about openness. People want openness. All right. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, a question from Tunisia, Mohamed Bati says, in case of COVID-19, what are the limits when we ask questions to patients uh, when it comes to ethics? Um, another excellent question. Um, as journalists, we should be pushy. We want the facts. We want the story. You must obey ethics. That means you have to obey the rules of privacy. Some hospitals may not allow you to show patients' faces. You must get people's permission. Um, you don't want to exploit their misery. Um, so ethical concerns are extremely important because you can't challenge politicians for being unethical and then you yourself are breaking ethics. That being said, we do have an uncomfortable job. We sometimes have to push the limits. And I'm very comfortable with um, being human about it and uh, approaching people. When we were in Afghanistan and we did interviews with victims of horrible, horrible violence, we didn't just come in and point the mic in their face and say, tell us your story. We said, we know this is hard. This is difficult. And if at any time you feel uncomfortable, you're in control and you should stop. We actually gave them the control, which I would never give to a politician, but to a victim, you could say, if you feel uncomfortable, we could stop the interview. So show your humanity, show that you're ethical, but at the same time, push. Um, I'm going to ask the organizers, I think, yeah, we've, we're just a, a couple of minutes over time, but we could run a bit longer and we have one final question. Um, uh, uh, from E Ming, and the question is, what happens when your politicians ask for a list, oh, I love this question, <laughs> ask for a list of pre-approved questions beforehand? Um, and typically we have to stick to the questions. And there are certain out-of-bound questions that the press secretary has said we cannot ask. All right, this is a difficult dilemma. Um, and obviously it's different in different countries. Um, so, Again, as I said, obey the rules in your country, even if the laws are restricted, don't get arrested, uh, don't break the rules, but obviously push. Now, um, I don't, I mean, in general, I don't think we should give questions ahead of time and interviews should be fair and open and we should say, what are you afraid of? You're the leader of the country or the, you're the health minister. Surely, you know, I'm gonna ask you about COVID. Do you really need the questions? Do you have to be such a baby? But <laughs> usually you lose and they want a list of questions. I don't mind sending people some rough questions, also because I want them to be prepared. I don't want to ask a question and then they say, oh, well, I didn't know you were going to ask that question. I don't have the numbers. So if you're planning an interview ahead of time, say next week with the health minister in your country, and they want a list of the questions, not a bad idea, because then when you ask the question, they can't say, I didn't know you were going to ask that question. So provide a list of questions. I try to push. And what I say is, this is just a general outline. These are the themes. And obviously the questions will change depending on the answers. That's reasonable to say. Because if you ask a question and they give an answer that you weren't expecting or they give new information, of course you have to ask a new question. That's your window. So use that, that line, that excuse, that these are the questions, but obviously there'll be other ones depending on the answers. When it comes to certain out of bound questions, I think generally we should refuse and not accept out of bound questions. But if they insist that there be out of bound questions, I think you could do two things. At a minimum, you must report to your viewers or to your readers or listeners. You could say that was our interview, but of course the minister insisted we not raise the question of the mask or we not raise the question of tests. He said we could not ask that. You should be transparent. Um, the other uh, trick to do, it could get you into trouble, so watch it, is at the end of the interview, or sometime during the interview, you could say, Mr. Minister, thank you for the interview. Um, it was very helpful, but I'm curious, why did you not want us to ask you the question about ABC? So you're not asking the question, you're asking a question about not being able to ask the question. So, um, you know, you might be able to get away with it um, and it can be important. All right, I think we've managed to answer most of the questions. Yes, we have. Um, uh, so I hope this has been uh, helpful for you. Um, it's hard to do these conferences when we, um, when we can't 
uh, interact in a in a real live way. Um, when I do this training, and hopefully I can come to your country at one point and do the training live, because we'd have a lo lot longer, we'd be able to look at some of your interviews and see where you're losing control. And I could give you much more subtle examples of how to respond. Um, just keep in mind, obviously, Everything on um, I've shown you is on my website, julianshare.com. You could download the slideshow. You could email me anytime. Let's keep in touch. Keep in mind that what you're doing is an extremely important job, but it's difficult. Even in the best of times before COVID, most of the interviews you will do will not go well. I've done thousands of interviews in the last 30 years, and inevitably most of them don't work out the way I want it. So the goal is not to do a perfect interview, the goal is to figure out how to do the best interview you can. Um, please be sure to fill out the survey. Uh, Stella will send you a survey um, of this webinar. Fill it up because it really is, is hopeful. Um, it really is helpful for uh, the center to keep these seminars going and for us to learn how we can better uh, work with you. Um, and if you like this one and other ones like this, I'd be glad to return anytime. So, Remember, stay safe. That's the most important thing. No story is worth dying for. Um, continue uh, the great work you're doing. Um, you are a frontline worker. You are out there with the doctors and the nurses um, and the other uh, healthcare workers because you are bringing a vital resource to the people of your country. So keep it up, keep safe. Thank you to Stella and the center and keep in touch everyone. Bye.